On this episode, we meet up with legendary film composer James Newton Howard at the Meyerson Center while he's performing with the Dallas Symphony Orchestra. We talk about his career and his legacy in film. All that and more coming up in this Go See Talk exclusive. And um, lo and behold, here I am doing it. So, I mean, I, I don't know how that happened, to be honest with you. I, it was just kind of some crazy, magical thing, but I feel very lucky. Hi, I'm Mark Chaffordini. I'm the founder and editor of GoSeeTalk.com. We're here today at the world-renowned Meyerson Symphony Center in Dallas, Texas. We've just had an exclusive interview with Oscar-nominated film composer James Newton Howard. Welcome to Dallas. Thank you. And uh, I guess we'll start with saying, um, why the Masters of Film? You're very accomplished in your craft. Um, what brought you to Dallas and what, what compelled you to do the Masters of Film? Well, you know, I've been asked a number of times to do this kind of a concert, to do a concert of my film music um, over the, the last few years, but uh, I, I'm so busy doing movies that I really didn't take the time to put together enough, uh, enough suites, really, from all the different movies to constitute a full program. Uh, the Dallas Symphony is just such a great orchestra, um, and I, I've been a fan of that orchestra for a long time. Meyerson, this whole center, is it's kind of a legendarily great hall. Um, and it just seemed to come at the right time where I, I, I just felt like uh, it, now was the time. So um, they asked and here I am. So, Ex excellent, yeah. excellent. Um, can we talk a little bit about your education, your background, sure. what first got you into music? Yeah. Um, I started uh, piano lessons when I was four and I was a classical pianist, piano student um, all the way through high school. I studied at the, the Music Academy of the West in Santa Barbara for a number of years during my high school years and then um, went to USC as a piano performance major where I um, actually didn't finish. I dropped out my first year because I wanted to do other things than practice the piano. And as it turned out, it worked out all right. But um, then most of it has just been sort of making it up as I go along. <laughs> wow. Yeah. So you've toured with Elton John. Mm -hmm. And while you had uh, an interest in, in pop music and rock, what made you transition to film music? Well, you know, I, I never had intended to be to do this. Um, I had when I joined Elton's band, I was I was in that band for a few years, and then I quit and I came to LA, came back to LA, and started doing a lot of session work. One thing I really liked to do, enjoyed doing, was doing orchestrations for records. So, I used to do a lot of s string arrangements for people. I mean, from Earth, Wind, and Fire to Barbara Streisand to Toto to I mean, all kinds of people. Um, and that was really fun, and I had quite a good reputation as a session musician. And uh, one day, uh, the, the, my managers, who I was working with at the time, said, you know, there's this little movie that came along, um, maybe you want to do it because we think you, you could be the next Jerry Goldsmith, they always said to me. And I, I, had, I, I really didn't want to do it, I was frightened of doing it, I didn't know how to do it, I, I didn't know how to write to picture, didn't know how to write under pressure, didn't know how to figure out how to synchronize. I mean, it's all the things that, that are intimidating about doing the job were in play with me. And um, I finally just said, yeah, I'll just do it. What the heck? And um, it was a tiny little film called Head Office. I think it was in 1984. And uh, I, I just had the greatest time. It was just so much fun. And I felt like I just had such a, an understanding, a, a kind of, a, I'm not just not in a self-congratulatory way in any sense, but I just felt very comfortable doing it. So uh, I did that movie and it was just love at first sight, you know, I just, I fell in love with it and um, I've been fortunate enough to uh, keep doing it ever since. So uh, the, the intrigue and the allure of doing a movie that, you know, something 90 minutes or so, mm -hmm. did you find that more or less difficult than channeling your efforts into a three minute track, a five minute track? Oh, it was tremendously challenging. I mean, fortunately, I didn't start off doing 90-minute scores. You know, I started off doing a lot of uh, very small electronic scores in the beginning. I, I don't think I did a, a full-on orchestral score until 1986 when I did um, Everybody's All-American, which is one of my first ones. But um, no, I found it, uh, you know, I had played keyboards for Jerry Goldsmith on The Twilight Zone. Oh, really? Okay. And that was a real mind-opening experience for me. Uh, I, at the time, I was endorsing Yamaha keyboards, and they had a, there was an instrument called a GS-1, and Jerry had written for the GS-1 and asked me if I would come and 
play it in the orchestra, which I was thrilled to do. Um, and just watching Jerry do it and listening to the music, and I, and I just remember talking to Arthur Morton, his orchestrator, and just just kind of asking, where do you, how do you even start? What are you guys doing? How do you ever, you know, all of these things. I was just completely overwhelmed by it. And um, lo and behold, here I am doing it. So, I mean, I, I don't know how that happened, to be honest with you. I, it was just kind of some crazy, magical thing. But I feel very lucky. Well, 27 years in the business, I mean, you, you've got the chops to make it. and You're one of the most versatile and in-demand composers out there. Um, with regards to your craft, what is your criteria for taking a project, and what are your first steps in getting started? Um, I take a project based on a couple things. At this stage of my career, there are a lot of relationships okay. involved. So I, some, a handful of directors, when they do a movie, it's, it's like a no-brainer. It's an automatic for me. I just do their movie. Okay. You know, you're, you're in, it's like a marriage. You're in there for better or worse. <laughs> And sometimes it's better and sometimes it's worse. But, you know, you're, the friendships are established and relationships, creative relationships are established and it becomes uh, very meaningful in that regard. Um, other things can have to do, can have to do with a, a new director who I'm really dying to work with, who perhaps has made a film um, f that I truly admire and I'll seek them out and say, if, you know, if there's never an opportunity to work with you, I'd love to do it. Um, sometimes it's just a great script with no money, and I just love the script and love it has to do a schedule. And the first thing I do inevitably is just start writing music. I generally will write a suite, like okay. an eight or a ten minute suite, just based on my impressions of the script and my conversations with the director. And I really started that process when I first started working with Knight, Knight Shyamalan. Um, and I've been doing it kind of that way ever since, because Knight really was one of the first directors I worked with that wanted a lot of music before he started shooting. Okay. Um, and that really turned out to be a valuable experience. I, I can't tell you the number of times I've written a suite before they start shooting and derive significant material out of those those suites end up being in the final version of the score. So okay. it's a good it's a good process. In terms of your process, um, without giving any of your trade secrets away can you take me through maybe an, an A to Z of what makes a James Newton Howard score a James Newton Howard score? Specifically, uh, the type of maybe research you do, something like Blood Diamond. You know, it sounded very indigenous to the region of the world that it took place in. Um, you know, Atlantis. No one's been to Atlantis, but you made a fantastic score for that. What, what's your research like? Well, you know, as a film composer, you never have any time to do really that. It's always kind of like Cliff Notes research. You know, okay. you do the short, you do the, sh take whatever shortcut you can take. I mean, in the case of Blood Diamond, um, that is a musical genre that, that I was familiar with and, and enthusiastic about. Um, and somehow or another, it just, you know, it's funny, you don't want to, you don't want to make a travel log. You know, because I, I really don't, I think that's a mistake when composers, you know, you're in Africa and all of a sudden you have pure this African music and a lot of and kalimbas and things like that. But at the same time, you need to address the sense of place. So it's a fine line of, of making the music credible without making it feel like, oh, we're, we're, in, we're in a kind of some kind of a travel log. Um, so the whole idea of Yusu and Dor was what really, to me, took that took the score um, and made it somehow transcend any sense of place because he's so amazing. When he sang over it, all of a sudden, yes, it was, it was about Africa, but it was also about, it was just about humanity. Okay. And that's the thing, you know, to me, it's always about humanity. That's all I'm concerned with is, mm -hmm. you know, no matter where you are, what you're doing, you know, whose point of view are we in? Um, I think I rely heavily on melody. I'm a big a proponent of theme. Um, I'm quite comfortable working in electronics and blending. I had a lot of experience doing that with Elton, blending electronics with orchestras. Uh, Elton was really the first guy to let me do orchestral arrangements of his work. And I bring a lot of that into my work where I, I try and blend a lot of, I use the electronic palette basically as a same as I would use a flute or a French horn. It's just part of the orchestra. Mm -hmm. I spend a huge amount of time. I produce my, my scores very much like a record, which is why Hans Zimmer and I got along so well in the Batman movies, just because we both 
approach our scores as if we were making a record. We take great care in the rhythm tracks. We take very great care in the programming. We, it's, it's, it's recorded in a very pristine, careful fashion. And the whole thing is cumulative in, in, in its impact, I think, um, as opposed to, you know, just sort of the synthesizers, the electronics, or the percussion of the choral things being any kind of afterthought. They're really carefully conceived of from the very beginning. Okay. When you're scoring for a film, um, like you said, you, you, you made it like you were producing a record. With a record, you can kind of take the song where you want to go, but since you're trying to sync up with events on screen or like um, an emotional undertone, is that, is, is it, you find that difficult at all to, maybe it's not all you because you're timing it to something? Well, yeah, I mean, it's difficult until you come to terms with the fact that what you're doing is, is film music. Okay. I'm supporting the film. I'm mm -hmm. always supporting in the film. Um, and if you don't want to do that, you shouldn't do it. You know, you should come and just work in a concert hall and get out of the film music business. Okay. So it is hard. It's hard from an from a, uh, architectural point of view, from a construction point of view, because there are many challenges one has to deal with. Mm -hmm. um, turning left when you want to go straight um, is difficult, but at the same time, I'm, I'm always very clear about what the job is. Okay. So that part of it, I never feel like I'm sacrificing anything creatively. I always find a way to 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 make it feel uh, to make it feel complete for myself. Well, uh, talk to me about your time frame. I mean, you, you score quite a few movies a year. It's getting to be quite a lot. Um, what time Too frame? Many. Would you, really. Um, it depends, you know. I mean, I just did The Hunger Games, literally finished it. Uh, I'm still not finished with it. I, I still have to mix it, but I did that about 80-some minutes. Wow. That I don't recommend. I don't like it, um, but sometimes, you know, I've gotten a reputation as being very fast, which I suppose is good, but it, and that really came along, I think, starting with King Kong and other things. But normally I would like to have three months, three to four months at least, on a movie, and uh, I don't mind them crossing over a little bit because now the, the, the schedules tend to overlap a little bit, and that's just the nature of the business, but um, having to sort of get into, go, go into the dark hole and, and work for four, four weeks and write 80 minutes is really not, not fun. Fortunately, it's a great movie, and the director was really cool, Gary Ross, and it was all good. But. So, should we take a break and maybe sure. uh, do yeah, some more later? You need to go meet with okay. Mr. Kasdan? We're back with part two of our interview with Oscar-nominated film composer James Newton Howard. Unfortunately, James's already brief window of time in Dallas was cut even shorter due to some scheduling problems. But a pure professional and a class act, he agreed to finish our interview on his own time and on the phone. Hello. James? Hello. James, can you hear us? Yeah, I can just hear you. Okay. How are you guys doing? Uh, we're doing very well, very well. I uh, heard you made it back to L.A. safely. That's great to hear. Made it back one piece. Excellent, excellent. Uh, well, I, I won't take up much of your time. I do really appreciate you helping finish this interview, and uh, I want to say thank you for your time up front, and we just completely enjoyed your performance with the symphony. It was fantastic. Well, thank you very much. Appreciate that. Well, let's start. Uh, when last we spoke, we talked to you about your time frame. You, know, you said that you would usually like about three to four months to compose something, but sometimes you end up getting about four to five weeks. Now let's, now let's say you, you take a project. How do you approach composing an original story like The Village versus composing something with an existing fan base like The Hunger Games or the novel Water for Elephants? Well, I don't really think about it any differently, quite frankly. Maybe that's a, a weakness, but... Um... I know I there was some I think some some of the fan base criticized my approach to the last airbender because I didn't sort of acknowledge or pay homage to the um, to the score that was in the I guess it was an animated series you know quite frankly I never even watched the animated series um, I think I watched one episode and I'm sure the music was great in that but I just I think the first my first feeling is that I'm there to serve whatever the film is um, and if that connects somehow with people's expectations of a pre-existing 
uh, idea, then that's great. And if it doesn't, then, uh, you know, you can't make everybody happy all the time. So um, I think in the case of Hunger Games, you know, that was a, that's a situation where it's obviously there's a sense of place with the main character. And so, so that kind of defines a certain vocabulary in the music to some extent. Um, but uh, and Water for Elephants really is, is kind of a limitless, uh, limitless possibilities because they're, it, it's, it's really just a dramatic, uh, romantic uh, uh, idea and story. So, I mean, it really doesn't have to relate to any kind of preconceived ideas. A lot of times what I do is, um, is sit down and just compose a long uh, seven or eight or nine or ten or sometimes in the case of uh, Signs and uh, Unbreakable, a 15-minute suite that just from, from which I derive a lot of thematic material, a lot of ideas once I start looking at the movie. So it really just has to do with, it's just really, a, a, it, I have to deal with it on an individual basis and not really think about any, any previously, uh, any previous constructs that either I or anybody else has. You were quoted as saying that the composer interprets the director's feelings. At the end of the day, is that the over, overriding, <laughs> sorry, overriding motivator? Well, no. I think it's dangerous just to it's dangerous to get into a situation where your a composer's <clears throat> primary objective becomes making the director happy. It's really it's really tempting to do that because every composer wants to get their you want to get your music approved and you want to get it finished and you want everybody to be happy, but uh, making the director happy isn't always the best idea. Sometimes it's really important to interpret the feelings and understand them and, and represent them, but then suggest that maybe that's not the best way to go and offer alternative directions. And I think that's what, that's really where the great value of a composer is, is showing, is offering a director an alternate alternative point of view about what the, what the possibilities are in his or her movie. I see. So then, when you are working, what is finished in your eyes? When do you know that you're done? Um, when the movie's print mastered, I would say. Um, I think this day and age, I don't really feel completely finished with the movie in terms of um, what the studio can ask for, what a director can ask for, even during the final dub, it's, it's entirely possible that I can get a call asking for some kind of a sweetener or a slight change, or uh, in, in some cases, well, I would say, no, by the final dub, we're probably usually pretty well done, but I, I don't really feel it's done until just about the thing is ready to come out and be in the theaters, quite honestly. I got you, so sort of a pencils up mentality, right? Well, I wouldn't go that far, but, um, you know, there's always a possibility for additions and changes and notes. I see. Uh, you are not going to be finishing the uh, Chris Nolan's Batman series, um, but you are going to be picking up what John Powell did for The Bourne Legacy. What are your thoughts on leaving one series and taking over something that's already, uh, again, kind of like a, a novel or a cartoon, already has a fan base or something that's established? Well, um, the, 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 the Batman stuff was, you know, I just really felt that I had made the, what I felt I could contribute to that movie and I, I, to that series. And I always felt that, and I think rightfully so, that Hans really, in my opinion, was the, the mastermind of those scores. And I mean, uh, they really sounded the way they sounded because of him. And I think his, his conception of the score was really brilliant. It's not that I didn't add a lot, I did, but it re I don't think I added the, the aspects of the music that were really, that really defined the, the, um, the character of, of those, uh, of those movies. I think that was really hot, and it was great, and we had, and we had such a good time together. And um, I felt that by the end of the Dark Knight, that um, there was one cue in particular that I had written a piece that I had written toward the very end, um, where Gary Oldman is confronting Harvey Dent, and Batman comes in. It's just, the, it's, I guess, it's just the penultimate scene in the movie, and um, I was really 
pleased with the way that whole thing culminated and I thought, you know, this is a good, no pun intended, note to go out on. <laughs> and then when Hans and Chris did Inception, I thought, gosh, you know, that was so incredible and the work was so great. Um, I really, you know, thought it was just let them get on with it would be a better idea. So that was a very friendly and um, amicable party of the ways, but they, they're going to do just brilliant work without me, I'm sure. Now, as far as the Bourne thing goes, uh, I always work with Tony Gilroy, and this is a prequel, really, so it's, we certainly will acknowledge John's work, and I have so much regard for it, and I've already talked to him briefly about the idea of incorporating possibly some of his material, but we're really going to kickstart this thing uh, from a different point of view. It's, 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 it really talks, it's really about establishing how these agencies came into being, um, a lot of different aspects uh, of the movie that uh, of the story that are not have not been covered in the other in the other in the other films. So it's you know I'm looking at it basically as starting over and kind of um, reinventing not reinventing but it's it's a different we're putting our own stamp on it. I just think it's a, it's a, it's an opportunity for a whole new approach to the story um, with a possible occasional acknowledgement to existing material. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. Well, as accomplished as you are in your field and the work that you've done, how do you define success? And are you still challenged? Oh, I'm incredibly challenged. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, uh, how do I define success? I don't know, that's a long <laughs> existential conversation. I mean, I mean, uh, I guess, if you're talking about professional success, success is when you can make a living doing what you love to do. And I've been doing that for a long time, 40 years, I guess. But um, I, I feel every time I do a movie, I'm, I'm, I'm very challenged. I, I think most people feel, you know, our stock and trade is, a, is an intangible. And it's, very, it's a very daring thing to do, to, to sort of sign on to delivering a score in four or five weeks to one of the most anticipated movies of the year and not have any idea what you're going to write and just presume you're going to come up with it. And, you know, so that, that's, that in itself is challenging and intimidating. Um, music is infinitely challenging and intimidating. Um, a thousand lifetimes and, and music would remain challenging and intimidating. So um, if, if, if one ever stops feeling challenged, I think it's time to retire. I think then you've entered the world of the realm of hackdom at that point. So, mm -hmm. yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, constantly challenged. And, uh, uh, you know, I learned a long time ago to accept fear of failure or just fear in general as just a constant companion and not, not something that is overwhelmingly uh, intimidating or uh, uh, renders you uh, not effective, but it is something that's going to be in your life if you're an artist and you're and you're trying to do something, trying to do the best job you can do every time you do it, which is what I do. Well, I think that you are, as a, as a musician, I think that you're an inspiration to people either in the industry or even people like myself who have no musical background. What kind of advice do you have for somebody who's maybe starting out or if you could also tell us maybe what's the best advice you received? Um, you know, I, I never know how to answer that question. What's the best advice? I, you know, I've always, I've always believed that if if someone is truly gifted, that they will rise to the top, that it will get noticed. Um, now, that doesn't mean that a lot of people that aren't that gifted don't get noticed too. They do, but I think that the most talented people that I've encountered have succeeded or are in the process of succeeding and I think will succeed. Um, so I would say my, my best advice is to, I guess, copy the people that are the best, that are the greatest in the beginning and learn, see how they did it. And then at that process eventually becomes one, one owns that process at a certain point. I, I remember, you know, Jerry Goldsmith was my hero for years and years and years. And um, I, I think, you know, I, he was, uh, my scores sounded a lot like Jerry Goldsmith for a long time. And that 
that's, that's, you could do a lot worse, and that's okay with me. And then eventually, the more I did it, the more I gained confidence, my own voice would start to emerge. So I guess the, the, the best thing that people can do is just constantly write as much as they can. I can't, I can't think of what else you can do other than just write, 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 write. Well, as I said before, I'm a, an incredibly huge fan of your work, and watching you conduct in front of the Dallas Symphony was um, just a fantastic experience, and it was an incredible retrospective. But now you have five films to your credit in 2012. Can you talk to us about The Road Ahead? What's next for you in terms of not just your films, but maybe personal ambitions? writing uh, concert music and I'm I'm interested in doing that too right now I've got so many interesting film projects in front of me that that's that's keeping my interest at the moment I'm uh, I suppose if I had to look really long term what I would think about doing is maybe working like crazy until the middle of 2013 and then maybe taking six months or a year off mm -hmm. um, and that's what I'm thinking anyway as people tend to be their own harshest critic, what kind of personal criticisms do you find in yourself and what do you find yourself maybe looking to improve? Uh, you could say I think I still overwrite. I still write too many notes. You know, I think I can do less, but I've, I've always been very aware of a film, of, a, of my score's life beyond the movie. And so I... You know, I think that pays off in a situation like Dallas, where it's just in some cases I'm just performing suites that are from the from the movies that don't have picture attached, and I like to think that they have some some interest and some sub substance to them. And um, but sometimes that I look at what I've done, and uh, I think some of the orchestration is a, a little tired, and I you know I, I'm just always trying to find a new way of doing things and. Sometimes one succeeds and sometimes you don't. And I think, for me, there's little things that happen in movies that make me feel like, oh, I've, I've improved in that area or I've, or I've managed to say more with less and more in a more economical way there or um, that was a really good melody or I look at what I've done and uh, I think some of the orchestration is uh, a little tired and I, you know, I, I'm just always trying to find a new way of doing things and Sometimes one succeeds and sometimes you don't. And I think, for me, there's little things that happen in movies that make me feel like, oh, I've, I've improved in that area or I've, or I've managed to say more with less and more in a more economical way there or um, that was a really good melody or, you know, little things. But I, I would say overall where I, where, I, where I really try and work right now is in two areas, writing less and you know, more counterpoint that you've accomplished so much and with the, your years in the, uh, in the industry. With respect to what you've already done, uh, uh, do you have a desire to revisit anything or if you had a chance, because you know, sequels, prequels, and reboots happen all the time. Is, do you have a desire to maybe go back and say, gosh, I love that, I'd like to explore that or refine it? Oh, every now and then, but I, you know, I'm not somebody who really looks back that much. Um, uh, there, there are I, I, I sometimes think I want to go back and open up an idea and explore that more, but the fact is I really don't. I'm much more interested in, in looking forward and, and moving ahead. Anyway, guys, i got to go. Okay, well, James and Mr. Howard, thank you for your time. It was a wonderful experience meeting you, and we really appreciate you spending some time with us. All right, guys, good luck to you. And you the same. Thanks. Bye. Bye.